Chemistry is the study of matter, and all matter is made up of atoms. Most atoms exist as molecules or compounds, with a few exceptions. And of course, the very air that you're breathing right now is an example of how these elements exist. In the air that you're breathing right now, there are single atoms, such as helium. There are molecules, such as hydrogen. And there are other compounds, such as carbon dioxide. Most of our air is made up of nitrogen, which is a molecule, okay? And can be classified as a compound as well. The argon gas that we are breathing is a single atom. And so today's lecture, we're gonna talk about how atoms exist in nature, how they form compounds and why, how we can identify the types of compounds they form, and how we're going to name those different compounds. So first we're gonna talk about what is an atom. Again, the most predominant atom in the solar system is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest of all atoms, so that makes sense. Hydrogen has one proton and one electron, okay? But that's not the same for the rest of the atoms. And so over the years, we've come up with a couple of different models to describe what we believe the atom is. First was the Bohr model of the atom, which had the subatomic particles of the proton and the neutron residing in the nucleus of the atom. This was discovered over a series of different experiments. The Rutherford gold foil experiment, for example. Before we came up with a new model, electrons were thought to orbit outside of the nucleus. The Bohr atom suggested that the electrons orbited in so-called set orbitals like our planets do around the sun, but then we later came to discover that they don't necessarily behave in a classical fashion. So the quantum mechanical model of the atom was proposed. We still can't prove that this is correct. Notice that we're calling these both models, okay? This is still theory. Of course, it's quantum mechanics, so if it's hard to understand, it's because it's quantum mechanics. Anyways, let's talk about these and how they make up the individual atoms. Protons have a relative charge of plus one, okay? Neutrons are neutral and have a relative charge of zero. Electrons are negatively charged and have a rel relative charge of negative one. In a neutral atom, protons equal electrons. When atoms become charged, protons no longer equal electrons, hence the charges. As far as the mass goes, as you can see here, the mass of the neutron and the proton are much more massive than the mass of the very small electron, okay? The proton and electron have about the same mass, the neutron being a little bit heavier, 1.67262 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, just four orders of magnitude heavier than an electron. When we take into account the mass of an actual atom, we don't consider the electron because its mass is insignificant when compared to the mass of the protons. And so when we're looking at the mass of an atom, we only look at the number of protons and neutrons. So right here is the very generic atomic symbol, or I'm sorry, symbol for an atom and giving out a little bit of different information. First thing we have this down here, the Z value is the atomic number. And this is the number of protons. Number of protons equals the atom. Every atom on the periodic table, every different atom has a different number of protons, okay? For example, hydrogen has one proton. Carbon has six protons. Iron has 26 protons. If I have an element that has 10 protons, then I'm neon, okay? Oops, then I'm neon. And so different atoms have different number of protons. And that is how the periodic table is arranged. It is arranged in order of increasing number of protons. Most of the time that corresponds to mass, but not always. Now, not all atoms are the same. Not all of the same atoms are the same, I should say. Here I have two types of hydrogen, 
This is called hydrogen one, the example on the left, and the other one is hydrogen two. The difference is hydrogen one only has a proton in its nucleus. It has no neutron. The purpose of the neutron is thought to glue the protons together, some sort of quantum stickiness, if you might. And so since hydrogen only has one proton, there's no need for a neutron. But from time to time, there are hydrogen atoms that are made that have a proton and a neutron. And these hydrogen atoms are called deuterium. Hydrogen is unique, okay? The relationship between these two are called isotopes. Okay, hydrogen is the only atom that's isotope has its own actual name, deuterium, and its own atom atomic symbol, D. Carbon has two naturally occurring isotopes, okay, carbon 12 and carbon 13. But again, when we look at these, both of these carbon atoms have six protons. How do you know that? Because they're carbon atoms. The difference is some of these carbon atoms have six neutrons and carbon-13 has seven neutrons. Why do isotopes exist? Honestly, they're not really sure. The Typically, the lighter of the two isotopes is the more stable of the two isotopes when they're formed in the nuclei of suns. Um, so suns, like, like our sun, okay? And then the less abundant isotopes are said to be less stable than the more abundant isotopes. For example, with hydrogen, 99% of all hydrogen atoms are hydrogen one, or about 1% of all hydrogen two atoms, okay? I'm sorry, about 1% of all hydrogen atoms are deuterium or hydrogen two. Iron has a couple of different isotopes that I've set here. Now iron has more than these isotopes, okay? Iron 56 and iron 54, but again, both of these have exactly 26 protons because they are iron. Not all elements have isotopes. For example, phosphorus only has one naturally occurring isotope, phosphorus 31. And of course, phosphorus is element number 15. Atomic number is 15. And so you can go ahead and you can calculate how many different, <laughs> I'm trying to do math in my head. There we go. It has 16 neutrons. Okay. So again, Knowing this symbol right here, this is called the mass number, and this is neutrons plus protons, and it's called the mass number because why? Well, because again, we don't take into account the number of electrons when determining the mass of the atom. The atomic number is the number of protons. This identifies the protons. And of course, the atomic symbol, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, is what you see on the periodic table of elements. And here we go, the periodic table of elements. So the periodic table of elements was proposed by Mendeleev, Mendeleev back in about 1850, okay? And it's put together in this fashion. Now there's other different examples of how the periodic table can be put together. This is obviously the most widely accepted periodic table. Every single one of these blocks has a different atom. Okay, and if you blow these blocks up, what you see here is we have the atomic symbol, I'm sorry, the atomic symbol, which is for this particular atom is cobalt, and it's always capital followed by lowercase. In other words, for cobalt, it's going to be capital C, lowercase o. If you write it like this, you have written the molecular formula for a compound called carbon monoxide. And so again, most of your elements will not be written because your class is online, but if you do write out an element, you need to make sure that it's uppercase followed by lowercase. If there's just one element, I'm sorry, if there's just one letter in the atomic symbol, it's always um, uppercase by default. Typically underneath the atomic symbol is the name, its average atomic mass, which we're gonna figure out how to calculate next unit, and of course the atomic number. And again, if you look at these, okay, hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, lithium three, beryllium four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
Okay, and so on and so forth. We go all the way down to, geez, I'm not even sure how to say that. We'll just say OG. <laughs> and I don't even know, need to know what this element is to know that it has 118 protons. Okay, only 92 of these elements are naturally occurring. Um, the rest are synthetic. So most of these elements, the heavier elements, okay, that you see after, um, sorry about that. Most of the elements that you see here after, oh gosh, I can't remember, uh, uranium, okay, are synthetic, okay, and some of them before, um, but we're not going to go into that. Now, all elements hook up to form compounds, okay? If they didn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. The universe would be full of just, just generic compounds or atoms, okay? The exception to that is the noble gases. So if you look at the very end of the periodic table, you have this column called the noble gas. They are the only ones that exist as monoatomic in nature. Now you may come across compounds that are made with these. A classic example is xenon hexafluoride, but again, this is synthetic. This is made in a lab and cannot be found in nature. We can do anything in the lab with enough temperature and pressure. Okay, the rest of these com or the rest of these atoms hook up with other atoms to form compounds. Okay. Now again, elements. When you say the word elements, we're talking about just that atom. But again, other than the noble gases, they exist as polyatomic. Okay. And so we have 10, which is, you know, like a 10 can. SN is 10. That's how you remember its name because SN is just 10. You have oxygen, which is what's called a diatom, diatomic. You have phosphorus, which is P4, it's called a polyatomic. Okay. You have these seven diatomic elements and this is how they exist in nature okay for example i can show you the oxygen the molecule of oxygen looks like this two oxygen molecules with two bonds between them and then we have two sets of non-bonded electron pairs on each oxygen atom okay the shapes of some of these other ones get a little bit more complicated so i'm not going to draw those okay metals on the other hand can exist as any amount what does this mean I have to have O2. If I break this bond here, I have what is known as an oxygen radical. Now, you don't know really what a radical is, except for you know that radicals are bad. Okay, so if oxygen were to break the two bonds between the two oxygen atoms, okay, you would no longer have oxygen. The metals can exist as any amount because the nuclei of the metal atoms exist surrounded by what's called a sea of electron. In other words, I can break a piece of iron in half and then have two pieces of iron. Okay, I just have two smaller samples of iron. But if I break oxygen in half, I no longer have oxygen that we can breathe. I now have oxygen radicals. The next set we're gonna talk about are molecules, two or more atoms. They can be the same or they can be different. Okay, so hydrogen, Okay, H2 is considered an element, but it's also considered a molecule. Carbon dioxide is a molecule. This big guy right here, that's actually glucose. And this is what glucose looks like. It's kind of hard to see, but it's cyclic. These carbon atoms here are all connected together along with this oxygen atom down here, let me change colors, to form a hexagon ring. And then you have other oxygen atoms coming off and so on and so forth, okay? Compounds are two or more different atoms. So while all molecules are compounds, not all compounds are molecules. In other words, ozone, which is a type of oxygen, is an allotrope, okay, is a molecule. It's not a compound. Carbon dioxide is considered a molecule, and it's also considered a compound. This is what sodium chloride looks like. We'll, we'll talk about why there aren't just one sodium and one chlorine atom, okay, with its molecular formula. 
but this forms what's known as a crystal lattice structure, and it looks like a block, for example. Okay, and a lot of salts look like that. Okay, this is iron three oxide, which of course is rust. Okay, especially those of you guys that live in places okay where you get a lot of water. Okay, you see a lot of rust. Now, why does anything happen in nature? To go to a lower energy state. So atoms are more stable when they're paired. Thank God, because if they weren't, compounds would not would not exist. We would not exist. Okay. And so there's two types of compounds we're going to talk about in general. And then I'm going to introduce a third at the end. Okay. The first one is an ionic compound. Okay. This is when you have typically a metal. There is an exception to that. Okay. And a non-metal. So how do you know what a metal and a non-metal is? Okay. Again, you've done your reading, hopefully, before you've watched this. But if you go to your periodic table of elements, okay, what you see, and I don't know if you can see that. Let me switch colors. Everything to the left of this blue line, okay, is a metal, including this little outlier here. Okay, this is what's known as our inner transition metals, lanthanides and actinides. Okay. These are our alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals. These guys in the middle are called transition metals. Okay, you can actually just read these. Sometimes they're called other metals. Okay, but most elements on the periodic table are made up of, or most of the periodic table is made up of metals. Okay, then we have our series of so-called non-metals. Okay, which make up the second half of my ionic, ionic compound. And those are basically carbon, phosphorus, solarium, okay, and down to iodine, back up to fluorine, and over the carbon again. Now, noble gases are considered nonmetals, but of course, they don't make compounds in nature, okay? And so, in general, if you're looking at an ionic compound, the easiest way to identify an ionic compound. Okay, is a look at that first element. If it's a metal, stop thinking. It's ionic. Okay, you can collect your $200. You can pass go. All right, you're done. Okay. The other types of compounds, of course, are what are known as covalent compounds. Covalent compounds are when we have two or more nonmetals. Okay, and most of the compounds in nature are covalent compounds, even though non-metals make up the smallest part of the periodic table. When we start talking about bonding, I believe that's unit number five or six. Okay, we'll talk about why that is then. But right now, you're just going to have to take a lot of what I say on faith. What I have here is a carbon atom flanked by two oxygen atoms. And that gives me carbon dioxide, which are both carbon and oxygen are both nonmetals. And so I have what's known as a covalent compound. Sometimes you always still hear these referred to as molecular. Okay. And typically we don't call ionic compounds molecules, even though they fit the rules. Okay. They're called compounds. So this is typically ionic compounds are just compounds. And then covalent compounds can be molecules or compounds. I really wish we were lecturing right now. All right. So let's talk about ionic compounds because they're probably the easiest ones to explain but they're the most difficult ones to draw the molecular formulas for because you have to be able to guess these. Covalent compounds, we have to tell you, okay? We have to tell you. Now, atoms can form ions, some atoms, most, not all, most, okay? And we're gonna talk about which ones can and can't in a little bit, okay? In general, metals will lose an electron and become a cation. 
Okay. And so again, the way I used to remember this when I was in school is that metals have a T in it. Cation has a T in it. And over here, there should be a positive charge, which I guess didn't come through when I copy and pasted it. Okay, there should be a positive charge up here. So metal has a T in it, looks like a positive charge. Cation has a T, T looks like a positive charge. So metals form cations, cations are positively charged. So this is what's called the lithium cation, okay? In general, your nonmetals form anions. Not all of them, but some of them can. And the ones that can form ions form negatively charged anions, okay? This is the neutral fluorine atom. It has nine protons, nine electrons. Cancel out their charges, it's zero. Over here, after fluorine gains an electron, it now has 10 electrons. And if you can see there, that's a negative one. Ooh. So now it has a charge. Okay, and so again, there should be a negative charge out in here that I guess, again, didn't cross over when I caught and pop pasted it. Okay, anions are negatively charged. And so you don't have to really, you know, just if you can remember that metals T, cations T, positive charge T, there's only cations and anions. So you remember one, then by definition, the other one is another one. The other one is the other one. And so this is how ionic compounds are formed. Here we have neutral lithium. So I have one, two, three protons, one, two, three electrons. But lithium is going to give up an electron. It's gonna transfer an electron to fluorine that has at this time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine protons, nine electrons, which makes it neutral. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. When we go over here, lithium now has three protons plus two electrons. So positive three plus negative two equals negative one. In chemistry, we don't ever write the one, it's always implied, okay? If it has a charge greater than or less than plus or minus one, then we write two plus or whatever, okay? Over here, fluorine has now accepted an electron. So now it has nine protons plus 10 electrons. So it's positive nine plus negative 10 equals negative one. Again, we don't draw the negative one in chemistry. Okay, it's implied. Now, this is how we draw it using so-called a chemical equation, but we actually have the, the compound. We don't draw the charges. The charges are implied because when you look at this, you see this metal right here and you know that it's an ionic compound because why? Remember I told you in general, if you've got a metal, it's ionic. And so you see that metal out in front, you know it's charged, okay? So let's do a little experiment here. Let's do a little test, okay? And so how many electrons are present in the following ions? Now, I went ahead and I gave you the atomic number just down here, okay? but you will need to be using your periodic table. So if I got, this is cadmium, okay? This first example is, is cadmium. When I go to the periodic table of elements, I find that it's right here. I find that its atomic number is 48. Is that 48? Did I mean? Oops, a daisy. Sorry, that must have been a typo. So it's 48, okay? So it has a plus two charge. What does that tell you? Well, this is a number of protons, right? 
So it must have 48 protons. How do I know that? Well, because if I don't have 48 protons, okay, then I can't be cadmium. Solve for x. x is equal to negative 2. So that's two electrons. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. 28. Yeah, sure is 48. Next, we're going to look at aluminum, which I know for a fact is atomic number 13. Okay. This aluminum here has a plus three charge. Okay. Which tells me what? Aluminum itself has 13 protons plus X equals positive three. X is equal to negative three. Okay. So I have three electrons. Again, remember electrons are negatively charged. So if I'm removing electrons, I go from neutral to positive. The next two examples are anions. So here I'm doing what? I'm adding electrons. So I'm going from neutral to negative. Bromine is atomic number 35. It's always hard to see there, but there's a little negative charge here. So in this case, plus 35 plus X equals negative one, okay? So X is equal to 36. Now, I'm sorry, negative 36. Okay, so we have 36 electrons for bromine. Phosphorus is atomic number is 15. Okay, I'm not gonna go, well, let's do the math one more time. Okay, phosphorus has a, or this anion of phosphorus has a charge of negative three. So again, plus 15 plus X equals negative three. X is equal to negative 18. So this phosphide anion has 18 electrons. Go ahead and do that yourself. There's lots of resources online with um, answers, worksheets, where you can where you can guess these or where, where you can see these. Okay. Now, fortunately, some of our atoms form carbon ions. Okay. Our group 1A metals, without exception, always forms a plus one. Let's talk about hydrogen real quick. Hydrogen's kind of weird. Hydrogen can do plus one. Hydrogen can do negative one. And hydrogen can form a molecule. Hydrogen's special. There's some periodic tables that actually put hydrogen kind of in the middle because he can go both ways. Okay. He can be a non-metal. He can be a cation, which makes him kind of like a metal. And then he can form molecules and anions. Okay, so he's kind of in the middle. So let's let's just put hydrogen in our back pocket. Okay, but all of my two A metals form plus one. All of my two A's form plus two. Now we're going to skip over here to the other side. Okay, my noble gases don't do anything, so they're always going to be neutral. And moving away from the noble gases. Okay, seven A is negative one. Negative two is six A. Negative three is five A. And so what you see here, these elements that have been shaded in pink do not form ions, okay? In the middle here, it can literally, it can literally vary, okay? But, oops, not always, okay? And so there are some exceptions to this rule, okay? Yttrium is always plus three. Lanthanide is always three plus, okay? Zinc, cadmium plus two. This is silver, AG is silver, is always plus two, okay? But chromium can be plus three or plus two. Manganese can be plus two or plus four. Copper, plus two or plus three. And so when we're naming compounds for these, for these metals that can form more than one charge, we have to take that into account. And I'll show you how in just a little bit. But first, okay, we're going to say, we're going to try to determine what charge will form from each element below. 
So sodium, we're going to start with sodium here, okay? When I go to the periodic table of elements, I look up Na. Na is right here. He's a plus one because he's a group 1A ion. So the cation it's going to form is Na+. Plus. The charge goes in the upper right-hand corner, okay? We're going to go look at phosphorus real quick. Phosphorus is right here. It's a negative three anion. So that is a charge of the anion it's going to form. Chlorine falls into the 7A category. And what you see here is all of the 7As form chloride. Uh, for, sorry, form negative one. Okay, and that's how you write that. Sorry, my lowercase l's in cursive look like that. Look at magnesium. Magnesium is right here. He's a 2A metal. So we're going to write Mg2 plus. Bromine, you see here, is right underneath chlorine. So bromine, chlorine, fluorine, and iodine are all going to do the same. Going to form a negative one. Oxygen, which is a 6A element. Okay, and all my 6A elements always form negative two. Two minus. Nitrogen, going to come over here, okay, and it's going to be a three minus, and it does that. We talk about how electrons exist in elements. There's actually a reason this happens that I don't have time to get into right now, and we're going to talk about why it happens. Um, like, literally, just talking about why this happens can be two lectures just on its own or seminars. All right, so... Now we're going to try to write ionic compounds. Now, this is something that I always remind students. All compounds, by definition, must be neutral. There's not a single compound out there that's charged. If it's charged, then it's an ion. If it's not charged, it's a compound or an element or a molecule. Okay? But if it's charged, it's an ion. Now, my charges have to balance out. Typically what we do is we take the charges here and we swap them like so. And so the value of the charge becomes the subscript. Okay, and so the value is plus one, so we're going to go with one for sodium. The value for chlorine, chloride rather, is negative one, so we're going to say one. Now, as I told you before, ones are implied in, in chemistry, so we don't write them. We only write values if there's more than one. For example, when magnesium cation hooks up with nitrogen anion, I'm going to swap the subscripts here. The value of the two plus for magnesium is now how many nitrogen anions I need. And the value of the three for the nitrogen atom is how many magnesium cations I need. And it works pretty well. There are some exceptions when it doesn't work, okay? But again, we're not really gonna talk about that. So now we're gonna try. How would I write the ionic formula for the ions the ionic compounds formed when these elements form ions. First, I gotta know the charge. So I'm gonna go look up calcium and I'm gonna go look up oxygen. So I come over here to this handy dandy table I have, okay? Let me get all this writing off of here so it's not as confusing. Calcium is a plus two. Oxygen is a plus, as a negative two, right? So it's calcium, two plus, plus O, negative two. Now, if we swap here, we're gonna get Ca, oops, Ca2O2, but for ions, we always take the lowest whole number, ratio. 
So if I divide both of these by two, I'm gonna get one, so I get CaO. So that's how you form, that's how you write rather the molecular formula of the ionic compound formed by calcium cation and oxygen anion, okay? Next, we're gonna take strontium and nitrogen, okay? SR2 minus, I'm sorry, two plus, nitrogen, three minus, so I have SR, oops, SR2 plus plus N3 minus. The value of the charges are going to become the other atoms subscript. So this is going to be SR3 and 2. Okay. Next, we're going to do aluminum and fluorine. So aluminum is over here by itself. Okay. It's plus 3. Fluorine, 7A, negative 1. So it's Al, 3 plus, plus F minus. I'm going to swap my charges, but then I'm going to remember that what is implied. I don't write the 1 for fluorine. And then it's F3. Okay. Cesium is all the way down here. Okay, it's plus one. What was the other one I already forgot? Oh, sulfur is over here. It's underneath oxygen, so it's 7A family. Oopsie. So it's Ca plus plus S2 minus. So again, we swap the charges. And it's Ca2 S. Okay. Now, that's how we do it with what are called monoatomic. Ions, in other words, mono mean one. So ions made up of just a single atom. So what happens when we start to do introduce special types of, of ions called polyatomic ions? Okay. So again, this is, oops, let me put this plus here. I forgot to put this plus here. This is a chart of the polyatomic ions that's from your textbook, okay? Why they have the charges that they have is again, something we're not gonna explain until further on in the term. You have to take them at face value, okay? For example, um, I can't just take and add up the charges of the individual ions and expect to get what I'm seeing here for these polyatomic ions. It has to do with how the electrons are distributed, okay? And so, again, we're not getting into that. But it just goes to show you that ionic compounds can have a variety of different forms, okay? For example, how many of you guys take magnesium carbonate? All right, this is in Tums. Okay, magnesium is just a single ion, okay? Mg2+. plus. Carbonate is a polyatomic ion that's overall charge is 2 minus, okay? Why is that? Again, we're not gonna get into why that happens, but this is what the carbonate polyatomic ion looks like. And when you calculate something called formal charge, okay, it has a negative two. It has to be together. You start breaking this apart and trying to figure out, okay, how the oxygens that are typically negative two, okay, and the carbon that doesn't even form an ion, how this happens, it's again, something that you just have to take on faith right now. Okay, so, but you need to memorize this list, okay? Um, actually, you don't need to really memorize this list. You just need to know why it's put together the way it is. There's only two polyatomic cations, ammonium, okay? Which is not the same as ammonia. We'll talk about that in a second. Ammonia is NH3, which you use to clean your, your floors with. 
There's ammonia. Ammonium has a charge because it's an ion. And so anytime we have a cation, we typically add the IUM. Okay. So again, we have methyl ammonium cation, okay, which is this guy right here. We have ammonium, which is pretty ubiquitous. Okay. Then we have some other ones that you might have heard of before. We have the phosphate anion. Maybe some of you guys have heard of the acetate anion. It's a common um, preservative. Okay, I've already talked about the carbonate um, ion, which of course is the active ingredient in Tums. Okay, cyanide, which everybody knows that cyanide is what spies take as soon as they've been caught, right? All those films, okay? Thiocyanate, which is where we add a sulfur onto our cyanide. Okay, but in general, okay, when we have these different compounds, why they have the names they have, again, you can look all this up. I don't have time to go over this, okay, but I am going to tell you something real quick. We have what are called oxy ions, or oxy anions, and these are anions that contain oxygen atoms, okay? If you have Two in the same family, the one with the fewest O's is the ite. The one with the most O's okay, oxygens is the eight. Okay. And so you can just remember this. He was hungry, so he ate more oxygens. Okay, um, and so we have nitrite, two oxygens, nitrate, three oxygens. Notice they both have the same charge, okay? We have the sulfur oxyion formula, three oxygens, negative two, okay, which is sulfite, sulfate, one more oxygen atom, but the charge is the same. Same thing with the sulfur, I'm sorry, with the phosphorus, negative three charge for both of these guys. Okay, but one of them has three oxygens, the phosphite, okay, and the phosphate has four oxygens. We can keep adding hydrogens, okay? Now, when we add hydrogens here, we're adding them as if the hydrogens themselves were cations, okay? So if I took sulfite and added a hydrogen, it would go from a negative two to a negative one, and bisulfite is pretty much the name that most people yet use, but hydrogen sulfite is also accepted. And then we also have the bisulfate anion and so on and so forth. Okay, you can go through these. Um, hypochlorite is typically the active ingredient that's in your bleach. Okay, these are all fall into a class of what we call oxidizers. Okay. Typically, the more oxygens, the stronger the oxidizing agent is. Okay, you use bleach. You can see what happens when you spill it on your pants. Okay, this is called purple. This is such a strong oxidizing agent. If you left it in a metal tin, okay, all the um, electrons in that metal tin would be gone and you'd be left with a pile of just dust. So we don't use perchlorate in our washing machine because it'd blow up. Okay, anyways, take a look at these. These are important to know. Let's talk about how we draw molecular formulas with polyatomic ions, okay? So again, remember what I told you. Okay, this is nitrate, okay? To be nitrate, it has to be NO3 minus. So it needs to stay together, okay? If we add magnesium, which is a two plus charge, we're still going to swap our so-called subscripts, okay? And this is kind of what it looks like. But the way we draw it is like this, Mg parentheses NO3. Now, I put the two outside the parentheses and I have to use the parentheses because if I just draw it like that, it makes it look like, like I have 32 oxygen atoms, which is just insane. So I put the parentheses here so that you know that I'm telling you that I have two nitrate anions. Okay, let's do some examples here. 
So again, you're going to have to remember the charges, okay, or look at your periodic table, which we're not going to go back and forth anymore, okay? Rubidium always forms a plus one, okay? So again, we're going to swap rubidium hydroxide. We draw like this. I don't have to put the hydroxide in parentheses because there's only one of them, okay? Silver always forms a plus one. So again, I'm going to swap my charges here. So I'm going to need how many? Three silvers and only one phosphate. I don't have to put silver in parentheses because why? There's only one of them, okay? This molecule here, I have to tell you the charge of the, of the metal. Notice the previous two examples. I didn't tell you the charges of the metals because they always form the same charge, okay? Iron forms a different charge, so I'm always going to have to tell you what the charge of iron is because you can't know just by looking at it. So we must tell you what the charge is, okay? I swap sides over here and it's Fe2CrO4, three of these, iron three chromate, okay? The next one is our only real polyatomic anion that, or cation that we're gonna be looking at, or one of two. Ammonium sulfate. Sulfate has a two minus charge. Ammonia is a plus one charge. So now I need to put my ammonia in parentheses, okay? There are more websites and more worksheets with answers than I can shake a stick at. Um, but be careful because, you know, there's a lot of polyatomic ions that we didn't talk about um, just because. Now, how do we name these, okay? So the metals are always gonna come first, okay? Followed by the non-metals. The metals or ammonium or methyl ammonium, okay? It's gonna get its name. So for example, iron or silver, okay? Or ammonium, okay? We're going to take the non-metal. We're gonna change the root of its elemental name and we're gonna replace the ending with aid. Aid, anytime you see aid here, you know it's an ion. Okay, sulfide, nitride, okay. The polyatomic ions, on the other hand, keep their names, okay? And so again, how do you get good at this? Well, there's a bunch of rules. So you just learn how to follow the rules, okay? Now, for metals that can have different oxidation states, let's just change this to charges. We use Roman numerals to indicate the positive charge. For example, Fe2 plus is iron two, okay? And again, we'd have to tell you which, which, which of the iron cations it is, okay? First one is silver. Silver always has a plus one charge. This is bicarbonate. How do you know that? You looked at your 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 um your list of polyatomic ions. Okay, you're gonna have to have that list in front of you. You're gonna have to have it in front of you. You can't just look at this and be like, oh, okay. And this does take practice. Okay, silver bicarbonate. Okay, for those of you that are in the medical field. Your body has a buffer system to change to make sure the pH of your blood doesn't change. And bicarb is the buffer of our blood, okay? The next one is calcium, okay? Calcium, again, is one of those two plus cations. It's a group 2A metal. It's always two plus, so I don't have to tell you it's charge. It's calcium. And then... nitrate because NO3 is nitrate. Again, how do we know that these are ionic compounds? Folks, metals, 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 okay? The next one is chromium. Oh, but what's its charge here? Oh, geez, I don't know. Because chromium is one of those metals that can have more than one charge. Well, remember how earlier we just 
swapped the charges to become substrates? Well, the good news is we can go backwards. Okay, so I know that this is chromium-3. I'm going to put the three Roman numerals in parentheses. Sulfite, I'm sorry, sulfate. Because that's the name of that polyatomic ion. Okay, so again, let's talk about how many atoms there are in these compounds, okay? So if it's just a binary compound or just monoatomic ions, it's pretty simple. Like, I can't fool you. I have magnesium two. Um, that's a bad example. I have magnesium three phosphide. Okay. I know that I have what? Three magnesiums plus two phosphide anions. So three plus two is five. Okay. For polyatomics, you have to tally up each individual atom. Okay, so I have one silver. I have one hydrogen. I have one carbon. But I have three oxygen. So one, two, three plus three. So I have six total atoms. Okay, in this silver bicarbonate. Do the same thing for calcium. Okay. For calcium nitrate, rather. I have one calcium. Now, I have two nitrates, which means I have two nitrogens. And I know that I have two times three, six oxygens. So I have a total of nine atoms. Okay, do the same thing over here for my chromium sulfate. Okay, by the way, this four should have been subscripted. So I have two chromiums plus three sulfurs plus three times four. And again, I apologize. Three times four, which is 12 oxygens. So that's 18 total atoms. Okay. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about covalent compounds compared to covalent or ionic. Covalent compounds are much easier to understand and name. Um, well, for the most part. Now, unlike ionic compounds where the metal will give up an electron to the nonmetal and they form ions, they actually come together and they share electrons. Okay, and then they form this covalent bond. So basically, this is a hydrogen atom. So we'll call this HA, and we'll call this one HB. They come together in space, and they share electrons. And the notation for this is this. So when you see this, what you're looking at is a covalent bond. And that just implies those two hydrogen atoms are sharing electrons. And because they're both nonmetals in this case, as you're just going to have to remember when hydrogen forms a molecule, it must be acting as a nonmetal. Okay. The rules for naming the covalent compounds are much easier. Okay. There are no metals. Okay. So there's no metals. So you just look at the periodic table of elements. Okay. And the element that is this away goes first. What do I mean? Okay. If I draw out the periodic table of elements, just the part that we need, I have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodide, sulfur. Do I have anything other than that? Nope. Phosphorus. And I don't have silicon. So basically, going from this direction to this direction, those elements are typically drawn first. Okay. Typically, and hydrogen is drawn second. Because when hydrogen is not drawn second, okay, or written second, I should say, 
it's something else. All right, so we're going to use a prefix. These Greek prefixes, okay, to say how many of each element there is. The first element gets its elemental name. The second element gets its anion name, okay? We don't need to use the mono if there's only one of the first element. So for example, I have four phosphorus atoms. So it's tetra, phosphorus, Sorry, I had a brain fart. Okay. This is one word, but I'm running out of room. Hexa oxide. Okay. Here there's two bromine, so I'm going to say di bromine mono oxide or monoxide. But we don't draw it M O N O O. Okay. It's just if the first letter of the element is an anion, okay, we drop the uh, second O in mono, okay? Let's come up here. Now, this is the exception, okay? I'm just going to draw a nitrogen. I don't have, need to tell you there's one. Nitrogen, trichloride. Ah. This is sulfur trioxide. I know it looks a little bit like sulfite, but look, there's no charge here. So it's not the polyatomic ion. Okay, this next one, oops, sorry about that, folks. Okay. Okay, is called diphosphorus because there's two. Penta oxide, carbon disulfide, All right? And so again, how do you remember that you don't know, that you don't need? So why don't we call this monocarbon disulfide? Honestly, I don't know. I wasn't in the room when these rules were being made. I cannot tell you, but you guys, most of you guys know it's carbon dioxide, not monocarbon dioxide. You know it's carbon monoxide, but not monocarbon monoxide, okay? And so again, I don't know why it's that way. I wasn't in the room, okay? I would have been like, hey guys, can't we just stay consistent? But alas, this last one, I have iodine. Penta. Fluoride, IDE, okay? And so again, as far as, as far as, you know, naming these, in my opinion, they're much easier to name than, than um, the um, ionic compounds, okay? There are some exceptions. H2O, which is an, a covalent compound, is water. NH3 is ammonia. Okay. And so they get their own, they get their own name because they're special. Okay. All right, guys. Um, I believe that's all the time I have. Let me double check.